Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help one million people reduce risk in their lives. To reduce risk in your life, go to myworstinvestmentever.com today and take the risk reduction assessment. I've created this assessment from the lessons I've learned from all my guests. It's time you start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, and I'm here with featured guest David Segura. David, are you ready to join our mission? Absolutely. I'm excited to have you on. And, you know, uh, truthfully, what your work is all about is something I'm really interested in. So let me introduce you to the audience. David is a, an accomplished entrepreneur and investor who currently serves as the CEO of Glassbox Media, a podcast platform that enables podcast hosts to grow their brand revenue and new listener base with direct investment and technology support. David previously founded Giant Media, where he served as the CEO from launch through acquisition. The company was an early video advertising exchange that includes Amex, L'Oreal, Dollar Shave Club as his clients. Launched in 2009, it was acquired by an ad, by an ad tech roll-up in 2014. David is also an active startup investor with upwards of 60 investments. David, take a minute and tell us a bit about the value that you bring to the world. Yeah, you know, I like to think it's my energy. You know, I have an open mind. I embrace risk, obviously. I try my best to try to minimize that, manage it as best I can. But the fact of the matter is that I just really love companies. I love startups. I don't limit myself to one category. Um, love ad tech, love media, but I also like consumer. I like AI. I like innovation. And I'm always very happy to support entrepreneurs. Mm. Actually, you're one of the first people to say that my value is, is energy. And I love that because, you know, ultimately, I mean, it, it's what matters. I teach a course on, you know, giving presentations. And I said the content doesn't matter. What matters is you transfer the energy that you have in your body into theirs. And they will remember you forever. They'll forget your words, but they will remember that transfer of energy. So I love it. And I can feel your energy right now. <laughs> Sounds so good. I want to ask you a little bit about, uh, before we go into the, 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 uh, the big question, I want to ask you a little bit about what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I probably should have gone to someone like you when I started my podcast, but you know, I'm kind of a loner. I think, oh, I don't want to bother someone else. I don't want to pay. I want to start it on my own and keep it low budget. I'm not sure if it's going to work. Okay, that was phase one. Now, after 500 or so, close to 500 interviews, you know, I'm at phase two or three. And you know, I'm just curious, like, what do you, what do you see in your business and, and how do you help people? Yeah, you know, I'm just a media junkie. I love all things media, emerging media, new types of media. So it was natural for me to gravitate towards podcasts. You know, my backstory, and I'll be sparse here, is that I sold this company, Giant Media, many years ago. Basically, that video exchange and network that you talked about in the, in the bio and had a really great outcome. But like a lot of people, after selling to a much larger company, decided eventually to, you know, kind of move off things after we reintegrated successfully. And, you know, had some fun doing a lot of investing and, and honestly travel, including to uh, Thailand, actually. So great country, very familiar with it. Um, but eventually, you know, ironically enough, because of COVID, I decided that it was time to get the band back together. And uh, not so uh, coincidentally, our, our non-competes were up as well. So we reorganized, built a new company called Glassbox Media. And simplistically, all we're trying to do is work with a lot of podcast hosts like yourself, a lot of your listeners, I imagine and essentially help them meet new brands that could make for great sponsors. We're leveraging technology as well. So we're serving a lot of these ads programmatically as opposed to doing it baked in. We're trying to increase the value of the catalog if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then I think one of our core value ads based on all the feedback we get from our incredible creator community is that they like the fact that we're willing to invest in them and basically help them grow their audience by putting our capital at risk and building, building that listenership. So things are going well, launched last year, and we're off to the races. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's interesting because, um, like, when you get a podcast, you know, you don't, I mean, there are some people that start off thinking about uh, sponsors, but, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't do that because I just felt like I didn't have much to bring to a sponsor at the time. 
And then mm -hmm. I started, you know, a couple, I don't know, six months ago, I thought, I thought, uh, what, how would I do that? I didn't even know how I'd do it. And then, uh, because also, you know, I have a full-time job. I have, you know, a lot mm -hmm. of work that I'm doing. So it's not like I can spend all my time doing it. And then I thought, okay, what's a product that I like? You know, I, I use Acuity Scheduling to schedule all of my appointments. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, why don't I just reach out to Acuity Scheduling? And they said, well, we're not taking podcast, uh, we're not doing podcast advertising right now. I thought, okay. And then that was about the extent of it. And then I thought, you know, I don't know how to reach those brands. So it sounds like part of what you're trying to do is bring together those brands and the people that are interested in advertising with the people that are building those audiences. Is that, that sound like it makes sense is what you're doing? That's exactly it. And, you know, one thing I definitely want to let, you know, uh, you and your listeners know is that being an entrepreneur um, is very humbling. In other words, we have a thesis, but as soon as we go out to market, it gets corrected. Uh, yeah, you know it as well as I do. And one of the simple theses is just to be candid is that we thought, oh, all our old clients, American Express, you know, Dollar Shave Club, all these amazing companies, they're immediately going to jump into podcasting. The short answer is they're aware, they know it's growing, but it's new. So they're not spending. So one of the values that we bring to the table is that we're educating a lot of those kind of larger brands, getting them comfortable and bringing them into the market. And then to your point, by bundling things together, we're able to give them the scale that they need. And that basically lifts all boats, if you will. Mm. Well, that's great. And for the, for the listeners out there that are interested, either they have podcasts or they want to launch podcasts and they want to learn more, uh, where should they go to, to, to be in touch with you and to learn what you're doing? Definitely. Check out our website at www glassboxmedia.com and you can also if you want send me a personal email david at glassboxmedia will reply fantastic and i'll have the link in the show notes ladies and gentlemen so just go there and click on it and i like the name i mean it's easy to remember glassbox media so that's really cool um, i'm a bad speller so i try to keep it simple <laughs> exactly exactly all right well now it's time to share your worst investment ever and since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be Tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it, then tell us your story. Yeah, you said it best. Like, I'll say this. I have a diverse portfolio like a lot of people out there. But when I say investments, what I really mean, what takes up most of my mind space is angel investing. I invest my own capital, you know, from having sold a few businesses directly into startups, literally the riskiest stage, pre-seed, seed, you name it. Sometimes I'm very often the first person to write the check. So I'm comfortable with risk. I embrace it. I sometimes probably chase it too aggressively. But like you mentioned, like nobody thinks that the investment they're making will end up being their worst. And the humbling part about angel investing specifically is that you can have all the confidence in the world and end up being like completely wrong. And then the vice versa is also true. A business that you weren't that sure about, but the founder was persistent. You decided, why not? I'll give it a chance. And then that business ends up being like, you know, 10X, 50X, you know, outcome. And it's very humbling. That's the one takeaway I'll say about just my investment career thus far. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's interesting. I remember hearing somebody describe it as like going to a kindergarten class with 50 kids and trying to pick the one that's going to be most successful. <laughs> that's about right. That's about right. And that's why power law takes over. But, you know, not going to dodge a question. That's the whole point of the show. It's hard hitting. It's unique. I like it. Mm. So I'll talk about that. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to explain it in detail. I believe in being transparent, so I will be. Yeah. Um, but I, I want to say the obvious, that I'm very responsible for this. I own it. Um, there's actually no hard feelings. Believe it or not, I'm still friends with the founder. Yeah. And I respect the company. And I'll basically be as detailed as I can. But years ago, I made an investment. I believe the first one is in 2017. And also did a pretty material follow-on in 2018 with a company based here in New York called Rumi. And that's spelled R-O-O-M-I. You know, for your listeners, basically, to get some context, obviously, folks in the U.S. might be familiar with them. They might not be. But they also have a pretty large European business as well. The best kind of comparison I can give you all is that there's a U.K. company called Spare Room. And the basic concept, very similar to the United States' Greg's List business, is that New York can be expensive. You know, Los Angeles even is expensive. If you happen to have an apartment, or even a home that you love, but for whatever reason, your roommate decided they needed to move, maybe they're getting married and they just wanna move out. You don't necessarily wanna give up that place. At the same time though, you might not be able to afford it on your own. So what Rumi did, and I think it's brilliant, frankly, I still think it's brilliant, is that they decided Craigslist and all these other tools are just too inefficient. We're gonna to build a platform, a marketplace, 
really market the hell out of it so it appeals to especially millennials and Gen Z. And we're going to give them a safe, transparent option where people can rent out that spare room and they can do it just on our platform. And the genesis of that business I thought was amazing. Um, the founder was brilliant, an amazing um, uh, immigrant actually from India. And he really had that kind of like unique energy, willing to work all night, do almost anything. And in my opinion, honestly, the best uh, presenters and, you know, kind of like pitchers in the business. And he won and deserved, you know, all the accolades that he got for being able to like do what he did and raise the money that he did, especially being a first time founder in his at first early and then mid twenties. Wow. And so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Keep going. So basically when I think about Rumi, brilliant concept, huge market, you know, sky's the limit. And not only did I believe in the company so much, but just to throw it out there, I was friends with um, AJ, the founder, and was eventually convinced to actually come on board. So not only be an investor in the company, but just to show you how serious I was. And again, I don't want to like, you know, pretend it's not the case. I was a, such a big believer that I joined as the chief strategy officer. And I was responsible then for not only the good, but especially, you know, the bad that happened later on. And I think looking back in it, part of the reason this investment was so challenging, it wasn't just the money I put in and, you know, like losing it. That happens. I can live with that. It was more like the mistakes that we made as a company and as a group. And I kind of feel what happened with Rumi in part is that the growth was almost like so rapid, you know, so spectacular in some ways. It led us to get, including me raising my hand, uh, less disciplined than we should have been, maybe overly expanding into different geographies. Um, increasing it in other cities. And basically the key to marketplace, as you know, probably better than anyone is liquidity. We had that in New York. We were becoming like, you know, something everyone knew in a certain age group. It's amazing. Dominate New York. It's a hell of a place to start. But when we raised our series A, and again, I mean this respectfully because I thought they were brilliant too, but our kind of series A lead investor, you know, was British. And even though this sounds a little crazy, they wanted us badly to expand and devote a lot of that capital to, to, get to, to get to London essentially as soon as possible. Even though all the data indicated that we should double, even triple down in New York. And if we contemplated any sort of geographic expansion, it should be to Los Angeles, not internationally. And to take responsibility for that, you know, the investment basically I thought at that point was at risk. I remember actually having one of those kind of like cinematic moments, uh, talking to AJ about it in her office in New York and thinking, this is wrong. This is not a good strategic decision. We got to push back. And in the end, for any number of reasons, we didn't enough. He didn't. And we kind of just let, just went with the flow. Mm. And as a result of that, I think kind of basically put the company on a path, but it was hard to predict. But looking back on it, that really was kind of like the moment, if you will, where had we done things maybe differently, had we even had like a fight, if you will, I think we would have won. You know, they're investors. They're not there to run the company, but ultimately it didn't work out. Did it, did you eventually go to London and it didn't work or was, uh, what, what was the, how did it end? Yeah. So basically, you know, we raised $12 million in this series A round. So it wasn't a small amount of money. It may not be the same as a public company, but for a startup, especially one in New York, wow. which, you know, still not exactly Silicon Valley still growing at the time, especially it was a lot. And, uh, we used a significant amount of that capital, I'd say to expand internationally. So not just London, but other places as well. And the issue there is that it was just very hard to get like people to basically list their spare rooms and their capacity. And this is also my fault too. Again, I want to take responsibility, not putting it on the roomie team because I was part of the roomie team. That's again, how much conviction I had in my own investment. Um, you know, we weren't as familiar, honestly, with the regulations maybe as we could have been. Yeah. And so as a consequence of that, I think we underappreciated just how serious the market is there as they call letting and uh, London. It's a very different animal than New York. Um, <laughs> I don't want to say this too loudly, but honestly, you can push the envelope a little bit. In the United States, there is to some extent at least a celebration almost of entrepreneurs uh, pushing the envelope and there's a ton of allowance. In London, not so much. There's fines, uh, there's forfeitures. There's a lot of things that you know we realized early on that we were gonna to have to adapt. And what I can tell you is it just didn't convert as well. So a good amount of that investment, I wouldn't say was wasted. We used different things that like in theory were worthwhile, but ultimately just didn't perform the way that we expected it to. In other words, it didn't perform like it did in New York. Yeah. So how would you describe the lessons that you've learned from this experience? 
You know, there's a lot of lessons, you know, both for myself, obviously, as the investor, and I'll try to focus on that. And then also some observations, because I know a lot of your listenership, you know, enthusiastic about business, you know, their careers, but a lot of them probably also like technology startups, um, whether they're involved with them or not, they're, they're interested. Um, on the company side, I'd say this, and, and me as part of that, we kind of, to some extent, let it get to our heads some. In other words, looking back in it, one of the things I wish we would have done is slow it down some. Uh, doesn't mean we have to grow slow. It just means we should have been more deliberate with some of those plans. Right. And had we done that, you know, we would have pushed, but I think we would have done so in a more constrained way. And that would have been more sustainable. And so looking back in it, just by increasing the burn rate, things like that, put us on a tough path. Yep. Um, the second part of this, and again, I take responsibility, you know, definitely not passing the buck, but AJ, again, who I respect, tremendous entrepreneur. And the funny part is that I'm actually eager to back his next company. He's that good. And I think he's definitely learned the lessons. So just to put it in context, how the relationship is, I'll throw that out there. But, you know, I've been there too. Um, you know, a 20 something year old, um, whether it's a PC or not, male founder. And I've noticed this is true. If you're American, German, doesn't matter. It's all the same. Um, not everyone, but most men in their 20s, me included, when I started my first company, just, you know, can have a hard time somewhat admitting that they don't know, or even I'm a little scared. And maybe that lack of openness can somehow lead to like an environment where people don't necessarily feel they have the ability to tell you no or slow down. And so as a consequence of that, I kind of urge everyone, you know, the listening kind of community to just kind of like test yourself, push yourself, regardless of your age, you know, are you being open-minded? Have you created a culture where people feel empowered to speak their truth, regardless of their seniority? And if the answer isn't, you know, I understand sometimes that's rational, but I'm telling you, at least in a startup environment where there's already so many like risks that you don't even know that are present, uh, you're more likely to kind of torpedo stay to the ground. So that's one thing I would say as well. Um, may, maybe I'll, I'll share some of my thoughts on it. Uh, you, I wrote down a bunch of stuff as you were going. Um, you know, one of the things is that I, I wrote down is about growth. And, you know, you, you talked about, you know, maybe we should have slowed down some a little bit, you know, and I think that it's hard because, you know, the whole objective of a business is to grow because growth means people want your product. So yeah. we got to embrace growth. But man, you see so many companies growing beyond the capacity of the operations to deliver what it is that they're promising and it mm -hmm. just brings in trouble. So I would say that's a great lesson from that perspective to, to that growth in and of itself is not everything. It's mm -hmm. got to be quality growth, growth that you can, you know, build on. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that, you know, it's funny because you one of the things I always tell startups when they come and pitch to me is I say because they're always, basically, they're going to come and they're going to say the same thing in Thailand in particular. They're going to say, here's how we're going to get the market in Thailand. And I always say the same thing. I'm not interested in how you're going to get the market in Thailand. I'm interested in how you're going to get the market in another country. How are you going to get the market globally? Because if it's just a Thai startup, I mean, what's the point? Mm -hmm. and, and so that's my challenge to them. And that's hard, you know. And now, now what I'm, I have to think about now, because you've just, you know, you've just explained a story that, well, wait a minute, that raised some complexity. Now, of course, the way to do that probably is to, I, I'll explain a story of what, what I did with one of the businesses that I'm invested in. We have a coffee factory in Thailand run by my best friend, Dale. We've been yeah. running for about 27 years and we supply you know, hotels, coffee shops, and we had a, an opportunity to expand to Vietnam and we thought that, hey, this could be good for profit wise, but also we built a platform across Southeast Asia it could mm -hmm. be more valuable, blah, blah, blah. And so we went um, and decided Dale would look into it. So he went to Vietnam, met the different people. It was definitely an opportunity to partner with a big brand, which was good. Um, there was a lot of good parts of it. But what we did is Dale came back after a few months, and we agreed to meet on a Monday. On that Monday, we talked uh, at, at nighttime. We sat in the office, and he presented the, the growth story and the, the opportunity, basically. And he presented it you know, as best as he could. And... You know, opportunity wasn't that huge. I, it was smaller than I thought, but mm -hmm. still, you know, it was interesting. And then after that, we went and had dinner. And after mm -hmm. dinner, we went home. And then we agreed that we would meet the next next Monday. So we met the next Monday, and, and we had agreed that what we would talk about the next Monday is the risk. Mm -hmm. We separated the discussion on return and risk. So then we went back, and then the two of us had kind of permission to discuss 
everything going wrong without feeling like it's an assault on Dale's forecast and all that. And in the end, we realized that the risk's too high. We could spend that money expanding into northern Thailand. We could expand into some other areas that we had that we knew the risk of capturing that revenue was much lower. Mm -hmm. And so it just makes me think that no matter whether you are going internationally or you're going, uh, you know, you mentioned about expanding in New York and L.A. Mm -hmm. and that type of thing, you know, take the time to look at the risk and return. And I, I, I tell people just try to separate those two things. Um, mm -hmm. The other thing, you know, I wrote down is the most important thing uh, when you're starting up is just don't make the wrong mistake. I can see that. So when, when people, when I tell people that, they say, but, yeah, but Andrew, what's the wrong mistake? And I'm like, I, I don't know what the wrong mistake is in your <laughs> business. But ultimately, it's like, don't get knocked out. Stay mm -hmm. standing. And there's that great story of Muhammad Ali when he was in his third fight with Joe Frazier. And they were going into the 15th round. Mm -hmm. Frazier won the first one. Muhammad Ali won the second fight. And now they're toe-to-toe. -to -toe. They've been battering each other for 14 rounds. It's hard to say who's going to win this in the 15th. Ali tells his trainer, cut off my gloves, I quit. His trainer says, no, you got, I won't do it. You've got to go back in. Ali said, no, cut off my gloves. I can't take it anymore. And then what happened in a couple of seconds later, Frazier's side forfeited. They threw in the towel. And that's where it really comes down to inches and seconds. You've got to stay in the game. You've got to have the capital and the runway. Uh, to stay in the game. The last thing that I want to say is, uh, it it reminded me when I think about um, being young and confident, and you know it's harder to take feedback, and you know you, you feel like you got to be confident. But I always tell my students now I've taught finance for thirty years, and when I go into my class, I tell my students if you leave my class feeling less confident, I have succeeded. <laughs> And I think that for a lot of young people, that's really disheartening. But in the world of finance, it's not physics. It's not the law of gravity. There are no laws. You know, it is mm -hmm. a, a totally uh, human-based endeavor. And mm -hmm. you can have all the formulas in the world, and it doesn't mean that you've got the answer. And I think that that's where, that's what I would say to a young person nowadays is, you know, be okay with having less confidence and then mm -hmm. build that confidence over time. Anything you would add? I, I, I spoke a lot because I just had a lot of things that resonated with me, but is there yeah. anything you would add to that? You know, there's different ways to kind of tackle, you know, and scale any company. But I think one thing that's kind of true is that you kind of know deep down what the big problem slash opportunity is. And I think to some extent, just for all the listeners, because I know it sounds a little esoteric, maybe Rumi makes sense, maybe Spare Room makes sense, but Another somewhat similar business with a different model is Airbnb. Airbnb obviously caters more towards vacationers, you know, people going on holiday, that kind of thing. But they also tackled and won uh, their leakage problem. And what I mean by that is that people, once they get to know each other, especially, get comfortable saying, hey, we don't need to pay on this platform. I know it offers insurance, but you trust me. Let's just take it offline. Now, Airbnb is still, what, from what I understand, and I know some of the early team, very, very annoyed that they think they lose about 10% of their overall revenue, perhaps even the profit opportunity to leakage. What they didn't know, and I guess no one knows until now, is that it was probably the inverse for us. We were losing probably closer to like 80, 90% of the overall revenue opportunity to people basically taking offline. Now, the reason behind that, at least at that point, was to live with someone, especially long-term, more than 30 days, requires a lot of trust. So inevitably, we'd connect them and facilitate these meetings on the platform, mm -hmm. but they ultimately wanted to meet each other in coffee shops, stuff like that. Once that happened, I guess one or two meetings was enough to engender that. And even though we were offering and trying really hard to offer them insurance, all these things that we thought made the transaction safer, most people kept taking it offline. Now, I'll be the first to tell you that I still don't know completely what that answer was, mm -hmm. but I do know looking back on it that that was the problem that between like us and the executive level, and our kind of like, you know, brilliant product team, we should have just, as long as it took, kept testing, kept doing different calls to action, kept probing users until we cracked it. Because once we cracked that, 
it would have been completely off to the races because everybody did like the product and everybody was finding amazing roommate and living situations in New York through our product. So one thing I guess I'd say is that you kind of know deep down in your heart, whatever you want to call it, what the thing that you need to do every day is. Don't put it off. There's a million things you can do. Maybe you can get away with it. Maybe it even works. But the truth is, if you ignore the elephant in the room, you'll probably regret it. And so when I think about that too, that was also part of like our journey. And I think where Rumi kind of went awry, you know, as an investment. Yeah, for the listeners out there, I think this is a really great part of this interview. And that is, you know, um, life is not meant to be super complicated. If you find yourself in a situation where you really, everything's really complicated, something's wrong. Mm -hmm. And what you're telling us, which I think is super valuable, is that we know what most of the problems are in our life, the big ones, you know, okay, I'm not exercising enough or um, I'm not calling my friends enough and building my relationships and I'm getting lonely. Uh, you know, this is, uh, I'm not, we're not doing enough spend on marketing. We know if maybe it's the operations are falling down, we're getting the sales, but we're not delivering. Come on, everybody knows. So that is a great lesson in this podcast, in this interview, from my perspective, to take us back to simplicity and just identify that problem. Maybe it's just a matter of writing it down, having a meeting and talking about it, but don't put it off is the message I'm getting from you. And I think that's fabulous advice. Yeah, so, I appreciate that. Yeah. So based upon what you learned from this story and what you continue to learn in your life, what would be one action that you'd recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? And maybe... You know, depend. I, I'm not sure where to start that. It could be when you first looked at the business or it could be when you're in the business. But think about that person that's entering into the same type of situation. What's one piece of advice? Yeah, just kind of narrow down and focus, you know, like it seems like boring, a little bit vanilla. But I think when you're looking at this investment or any other, um, when you think about the growth trajectory, and I think unlike other investments, like it's kind of hard, for example, to influence Elon Musk at Tesla. I'm a happy investor, even though every day is a roller coaster up and down, but there's realistically only so much you can do. On the flip side with startups, whether you're the founder or you're an angel investor or even a VC in their company, there's actually a fair amount you can do. There is. You, get, you have a lot of influence with those guys. And so when I look back at like, hey, you want to avoid my fate, you want to like basically not see an investment go from X all the way just completely down, um, evaluate what they're doing, be honest with them and yourself, and then by all means, just try to figure out ways, like you said, to minimize risk. And a lot of times that means just to focus. And I think if you do that, this company would have been more successful. I think you could cross apply that to almost any company. I've never known a company that benefited from overexpanding initially. All right. So what's one resource that you'd recommend for our listeners? So there's really two things that I really kind of believe in very strongly. Uh, networking. I really do think people love talking about their stories and themselves. So whether that means you got to find someone online or in real life, just ask. You'd be surprised. Most people, 80% of them, are more than willing to kind of pass on like their wisdom and their guidance, in addition to also their follies. And I think you can learn from that. The second thing is, and it's not always popular in the age of everything digital, and that's ironic because I'm obviously a digital guy myself, but I'm a big believer in reading. So sure, that can be an audible, that can be on a Kindle, but almost every problem that you have, whether it's personal or business, in my personal experience, has been written down. Something very close to it has already been solved or tackled and approached. And I remember when someone told me that many years ago, I thought about that and I found that to be completely true. So it can be tedious. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but I encourage everyone just to read as much as possible. Even if you only do it for 30 minutes a day, force yourself to do it. If you're stressed out, do it. Um, you know, kind of family, like, you know, commitments, et cetera, I get it, still do it. And I think as long as someone does that, that's the best way to kind of expedite learnings. Yeah, and it's a it's an it's an um, a compounding you know effect. Mm -hmm. I look up. I I'm just building a new bookshelf on my wall, and it's full mm -hmm. of books. Probably seven hundred books here, and I've read thousands of books. And I look at the top shelf, and what I have is about fifty books on the U.S. Civil War. I just got interested, and then I started reading mm -hmm. it, and all of that information now is in my head, <laughs> and it's amazing. And then I can think of you know much more deeply about that time, that period of time, and. What can we learn from that? So really, really support that idea of reading. 
All right, last question. What's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Hmm. I want to grow Glassbox Media into, at least in the U.S., a household name. I want us to be like the company that people think of, creators, podcast hosts, when they want help, when they want to scale the revenue and scale their audience. And we're thinking about the best way to do that. Fantastic. And, uh, well, you're on your way with us. Myself and my, uh, my crew are going to check it out. So, listeners, there you have it, another story of loss to keep you winning. If you haven't yet taken the risk reduction assessment, I challenge you now to go to myworstinvestmentever.com and start building wealth the easy way by reducing risk. As we conclude, David, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? Thank you for having me. I hope you got something out of this. Well, we definitely did. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our wealth. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, this podcast is about one guest, one story, one mission to help one million people reduce risk in their lives. Fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.